Welcome back to another UNC Tar Heels football recruiting podcast here on TarHeelIllustrated.com. And if you're watching us on our YouTube channel, that is called Tar Heel Illustrated. I'm THI publisher Andrew Jones, and joining me is our director of football recruiting, Miss Dina King. And Dina, I would say the last two months have been about as exciting a time in recruiting as we've covered. I mean, I just started my eighth year as publisher here at THI. And with the dead period for 15 months, then everything just exploding in June with all the live visits, a three-week period to kind of chill, but let kids collect their thoughts and figure out what they like and what they don't like. And then boom, last week of July, kids are allowed to visit, culminating with the Carolina cookout last Saturday. You have been cranking out amazing content from the cookout. You've talked to so many of the kids uh, that were there family members of kids that were there and they got a commitment. It wasn't a class of 22 kid, at least publicly right now. They did get a class of 23 in the way with Tad Hudson. We're not going to talk about Tad. We addressed that in a podcast a couple of days ago. Your thoughts in general, the two months and most importantly, the last Saturday in July, because I think that that was really, really telling. That was sort of give you gave you a healthy snapshot of what those two months ultimately produced in addition to the commits and some of the kids that have not yet committed, but were on hand. You said exciting for fans probably, probably is exciting trying to figure out 18, 17 year olds minds, you know, uh, but very uncommon. I've never had a recruiting season like this. I asked Mac about that back when we had him, uh, at his uh, spring, summer, little press July, conference. July, press yeah. July 8th, we have a little Yeah, and uh, he, he, he said he'd never had anything like this. And being a recruiting person, yeah, I've never had anything like that because I, I, I really I feel bad saying that I basically could not keep up with what kids were coming around. It looked like a turnstile there at the Keenan Football Center trying to keep up with with everybody. I mean, you had to follow them on social media. They have photo shoots, uh, tweeting out, I'm here. And, and it's like, I almost feel like a detective or something, you know, but two, two months have been really, really great for UNC football recruiting that are, they've got 12, 20, 22 kids. And you mentioned they got the 2023 started off with Tad Hudson uh, this past Sunday. So, um, you, you know, the 22 class, it, it's dwindling down the, the prospects, but uh, we always have to keep our eye open for, you know, a, a sleeper kid that may, may develop during, because high school football here in state, Virginia, uh, the surrounding states are ready to start going. And, and not that the staff is pursuing committed kids elsewhere, but there's always the chance that someone could decommit from somewhere and make themselves available. We saw that happen last week. And the staff's going to jump right in if they're interested. We saw that with Benji Gosnell. We will talk about Benji Gosnell and uh, five or six other kids from 22. Just let people know there are not a lot of lines in the water for the class of 22 right now. You could count them probably on both hands, how many lines are in the water. We've reported for some time now, the class would be probably no more than 14, but we've amended that here in the last month. It's certainly talking to Mac on July 8th. He made it very clear that they're prob they're, they were trying to figure out ways where they would be able to add to it, go a little bit more than that. He didn't publicly throw the number 14 out, but that's what we knew the number was. I believe it's now 16 and possibly 18, depending on certain kids. I, I, they aren't going to turn certain kids away. The six we're going to talk about today, I don't think they turn any of these guys away. So they got 12 in the books right now. If Jake Pope, Zach Rice, Travis Shaw, George Petaway, Benji Gosnell, and Andre Green wanted to commit tomorrow, I think the class goes to 18. I think they take all of them right now. What do you think? You're not turning those kids down, like no. you said. They are uh, Jake Pope is like Carolina's main target there at safety. We've talked about how much 
uh, he thinks a lot of uh, Coach Bateman and everything. And then you got a couple of five stars and Shaw and Rice that game changers are on the in the trenches. And then you have playmakers in Petway and Andre Green. And then you've got a versatile kid like Benji Gostel that can play either side of the ball. So I'm telling you this, if, if Carolina was to land all, th- all six of them, I don't know what would what would happen in, in, in the Keenan Football Center. I mean, it, it, it's just, you know, I'm not saying they're going to, but, it, you know, they're still in the hunt. They're in the, the top list of all those kids that are – that those six kids. Five. Five of them were at the cookout. And we know that, you know, Pope has been up a couple of times and he's sort of, he told you about a month ago, he's just figuring stuff out. He kind of, he's gotten the intel, I think. What do you think it is that he told you that he might commit somewhere quietly and wait a while to announce? And that conversation, I think the last time you talked to him, I believe was around a month ago, correct me if I'm wrong. What do you think the deal is there with him? What do you, what do you think, why has he not committed somewhere yet in do you anticipate it's sort of any day Jake Pope commits to somebody? Carolina fans got to remember they're not used to being in this situation much. They are they're in big boy territory. They're recruiting against big boys, and when you get when you have these elite kids, a lot of them like to drag it, you know, to fall. And some of these recruitments are going to probably most likely go to the file because kids want to see game day environments but the on the flip side you know if you want to go to a certain school and and, and their their boats are filling up <laughs> for say you got to pull the trigger so jake he's a georgia kid and um he had georgia in his top five along with alabama ohio state notre dame and unc uh, he couldn't come to the cookout because of something. Uh, Buford, his his high school was really big time program in Georgia, and he had some stuff going there on around there. So it kind of limited the only place basically he could go if he was going anywhere was Georgia. So he went to Georgia. So I don't know. I don't know if Georgia's increased their you know, their message to him and, and, and maybe they have missed out on some kids and they're focusing on, on Pope, but uh, it's hard to say with 17 and 18 year olds, you know, they, they can change their minds on a dime on some stuff. Well, and also if you look at the list of the schools that are interested in all these kids, they have big decisions to make for some kids an offer from North Carolina might be their high end thing. And like, wow, I got to take this while I can. I think we're now with 12 kids in the books, with these six that they're going after, and these aren't the only six. I mean, we know that there's some communication going on with other kids. We're going to focus on these guys, though. A, these kids all probably know Carolina's going to take their commitment whenever they commit. The other side of it, Carolina's like, okay, we've got 12 in the books. If we get half of these six, we've got 15. We're pretty good to go. And we still have time to wait it out. Maybe somebody, there's some movement down the road and they, they find another, maybe a kid decommits from somewhere and they grab him or something like that. A lot of kids might be waiting to see what these guys do before making decisions. So there could be some late players in the game. We're not going to address any of those kids individually tonight. So it is an interesting point where they are. Carolina fans are not used to kind of having to sit back and wait. They did a couple of years ago with Trenton Simpson and they didn't like that because he was waiting for the Clemson offer and he got the Clemson offer at the last minute. And of course he was going to go to Clemson. That was a, that, that, that loss for UNC fans stung, but I think it taught him something. It taught him something that that's going to happen sometimes when you're in the game with kids like that. But now and see, but he was like the only player like that. They were, they were in that situation with now they got a lot of them. They're going to get a couple of these kids, I would assume. So they're going to have enough successes and really, if you recruit 80 kids like these dudes every year, you only need to bring in about 20, 22, and you're in really good shape because they all can't go to Bama, they all can't go to Clemson or Ohio State, and they all can't go to North Carolina. I would imagine Mac and the staff's uh, percentage, because uh, they don't give out many offers. And, no. you know, you, 
we'll have to figure that out. I mean, maybe some number crunches about the offers and how many they land when. when are you, they are you volunteering to do more research? <laughs> when they I accept. Right Please time. do. Please do. <laughs> I accept. But, you know, that's just Clemson's known to do that. Um, limited numbers. The net is not cast very far. They have their their targets. And so uh, we've had to deal with that this year. We haven't, I've, I've really haven't had to, the 22 class really, uh, there's, they've always been the same kids, you know, I've, you, you've asked, do we have any uh, recruiting thing? Well, I've, I've, uh, I've got this certain amount right here. There's no other offers going out. So 23 will probably be a lot different because it will be, it will be a, a full class, I believe. Well, go, going back to the other five, because we just hit on Jake Pope a little bit, let's talk about Benji Gosnell, who decommitted from, uh, from Ohio State. He visited Clemson a couple of days later, was at the cookout at Carolina. He had a fantastic time at Clemson. Uh, you, you had a really good interview with him where he's very open about that. And that, that's good. I, I like seeing kids excited. He's got some tremendous options, although – he doesn't have an offer yet from Clemson, correct? No, he doesn't. Okay, and but he had a fantastic time in Carolina. For some people who don't know, watching or listening, his older brother Stephen is a wide receiver at Carolina, who I think is going to have an opportunity to crack the rotation for the Tar Heels this fall. So, what is the latest with Benji, and and how valuable is that card that Carolina has played? Like, hey, you can start out wherever you want to start out if you come here, as far as the position goes. And by the way. It's not just with him. They do that with a lot of kids. When they, do I reached out, Boy kids, they did it with a bunch of them. When I reached out to him the night he decommitted to uh, from uh, Ohio State, um, the person I, I kind of was hesitant about asking him, you know, hey, you know, Benji, has anybody reached out to you? And he's like, yeah, a few schools have reached out, especially UNC. Naturally, they would have because of Stephen being there, because Benji had Carolina in his top top list when he when he committed to Ohio State. But at that time, Carolina was recruiting him. They they saw his potential on defensive side at linebacker, um, and the other schools, Ohio State, um, Florida was another one. They they all liked him at tight end and. I don't know. Uh, some kids have preference. I think BG's preference was to play on the offensive side of the ball. And so he saw potential of what Ohio State, with their great season they had with Justin Fields playing in national championship, they, they, they uh, used the tight end a lot. So, you know, he, he went, he committed there. But um, uh, I did ask him if, you know, who else, and he was like, he named off Clemson, that he was going to Clemson Thursday, and like you said, had he had a great time. He got to meet Dabo, Grant Venables. Um, Clemson's going to recruit him as a defensive end. And then when I asked him about Carolina going to the cookout, he said yes. And uh, he, he said that um, Coach Brown told him that they would be let him decide. Uh, what what position, what uh, offense or defense. And he said that that really made him feel pretty special that they're we're just basically recruiting him as an athlete. Uh, Virginia Tech can be a, a sleeper in this because he did transfer back to Carroll County in Hillsville, Virginia. He played at East Surrey for the last couple of years. Um, with them being right in the shadow of, you know, Virginia Tech, uh, yeah. a four-star uh, Virginia Tech, South Carolina may be interested too. I think there's going to be between those four. He's keeping his options. I don't know if he's in a hurry to, to make a decision again because he, he wants to make sure because that, that doesn't look good you know, commit and decommit, commit, decommit. So, well, I, but I was going to ask you though, a lot of kids when they decommit, they do it because they have something else in mind, not just reopening it and starting from scratch in a sense. Mm -hmm. and he's not starting from scratch, but in some ways he is. He's, he's, 
re-looking at things. I think the Clemson factor here makes it sort of a starting from scratch scenario. I think, you know, go, going back and looking at Carolina again, you know, when he committed to Ohio State, Carolina's class of 22 wasn't much at all yet. Now it's a different class. They didn't get Caden Helms. If he wants to play tight end at Carolina, he doesn't have to worry about them bringing in a twenty uh, a, Kate, a guy like Caden Helms because he, he he chose Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. So I do think, and also the fact too that he might be one of these kids that says, "Look, if I commit to North Carolina, when I go in, they'll find a place for me. I may want to start it here, but they might move me somewhere else. They will fit me in. You can, if he if he chooses another school, they have something specifically in mind. He doesn't really fit there. How does that?" play out over time. So I think that's an interesting situation for him. He's got a little bit more to consider with Carolina. Does he want to play with his brother? Does he want to play fairly close to home? I mean, it was the state he was in for a while. And does he like that little extra carrot that Carolina threw in there? But there is obviously major appeal to some of those others. What term have I always... And and by the way, real fast, and you told me about Virginia Tech earlier today when we were talking about Ben James Well and and I think that's an interesting little caveat to this because a lot of people aren't looking at the Hokies like that right now. Justin Fuente has struggled a little bit on the recruiting trail, uh, and they haven't been beating Carolina out for too many kids. But that would be interesting if the Hokies become a big player there. That would be a big get if they got Gosnell, a four-star. Um, not saying that he wouldn't be big for Clemson or uh, North Carolina. Anytime you get a four-star, you know, it's, it's, it's huge. But, you know, the term that I've always used with this class is versatility. How many kids are versatile? They they can play different positions. I mean, Caldwell is listed as a DB, recruited as a linebacker. Chapman listed as an all-purpose bat, plays slot, wide receiver, runs runs the ball, Holloway, wide receiver, DB, so, and it's on and on and on, so... Uh, Gosnell would fit, you know, just as an athlete. Uh, George Petaway is someone that we've talked about countless number of times here on these podcasts, written about him a lot. We've all seen him. I think we've had four, three or four THI staffers have seen him in person, talked to him. Um, what, there's something interesting that's taken place in his recruitment in the last six weeks about some of the other places that he's very interested in which leads you to believe that Carolina is increasingly in better shape. Why don't you kind of explain that to everybody? You look at his visits, he, he, he liked, he went to Penn State. Uh, they filled up in running back room. It's ironically, O'Malley and Hampton was another key target for Penn State as well. But Penn State took two commits. Uh, Michigan is a uh, filled up where their allotment uh, Florida as well. Um, and that kind of, I mean, I'm trying to, elim- you know, go by elimination. Uh, North Carolina is very attractive because they can sell George on, look, look what we just put in the NFL, two 1,000-yard backs. You know, they're in the NFL. They're, they're making millions now. We didn't wire them out. We gave them eight equal carries, equal reps. We didn't wear them out. They may have a good lasting career in the NFL, which is, I've had several NFL guys tell me it means not for long. <laughs> so uh, very attractive for Petway to, to consider UNC and being from Virginia, Virginia Tech wasn't in the picture. I do think Virginia may have uh, had some interest in, and of course he's, it's been the home state, uh, possibly uh, looking there, but you know, a North Carolina Virginia battle. I, I, he's been to North Carolina several times, and then you just have to see, like you said earlier in the podcast, what happens. Does kids decommit? Do they find something? Uh, is there uh, things happen? Whether it's out of control, maybe another school that that enters the picture with pet way if a kid decommits. So, you know, you, ju- you just don't know. And um, I-, I think of all the six, he might be the closest to revealing his decision. And I do think of all the six, the odds at UNC 
for UNC are increasing. And, and I think the Javante Michael, Javante Williams Michael Carter factor is absolutely in play here because if you haven't seen Omar in Hampton's film, watch it. There's a little Javante stuff going on there. If you haven't seen George Pet Petaway's film, watch it. There's a little Michael Carter stuff going on there. So they've already shown through two years that they completely can coexist with guys like that. They can have a lot of success, as you were talking about a minute ago. And that's an enormous sell point. Plus, you know, the saving on the wear and tear. If you can get one more year in the league, that's an extra million dollars or more. And that's, that's you know, if, you, if you stream together four or five of those, that's, that's generational changing money right there. So mm -hmm. uh, these kids are thinking along those lines. And clearly Petaway has to have that, – that's a tremendous selling point for him. And, and I, you know, we kind of thought, hey, you know, maybe this will go ahead and happen because of what's happened at those other schools. But you think maybe he's just kind of sit back and see what happens elsewhere or he's just waiting for a certain time and he might want to go ahead and reveal wherever he's going to go? What, 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 is your, what is your sense on that? We don't know what happens behind closed doors. I mean, he, I don't know about the term solid commit or whatever, but we don't know. I mean, he, he may have told the staff something uh, this weekend. Uh, you, you know, we don't, we don't know. I mean, only Mac and probably Porter knows that. Well, no, yeah. But no, uh, yeah. uh, I, I don't know. I mean, he may – he's very close with a lot of the, the Virginia guys. And he's been on Twitter saying when wherever he goes, he's bringing some horses with him. Well, you look at the teams that is, I mean, you look at the players who's left and the teams involved, Andre Green, Zach Rice, the two other fellow Virginians. There's only one common school that they're all looking at. So Maybe he's trying to recruit them. Who knows? I, I, I don't know. I don't have an answer. Well, that's a good segue. Let's go to Andre Green. Andre Green is someone we haven't talked about as much as some of the others. A little tougher getting rock solid information on him. And I, I think when you and I talked back at the end of June, when we were just having you know a private conversation about some of these guys, it's kind of hard to have a feel for him. Kind of have a, hard to have a good vibe about what's going on with him. But he was back in Chapel Hill. He's got a couple other big time programs that he's interested in. Um, what What is your uh, take right now on where Andre Green and Carolina stand? He's one of these kids that I think he's an elite four star. He he could be a five star. He's got that big playability that um, you just you just want out there on the at wide receiver. He had a top I think top twelve or top thirteen. He's possibly going to narrow, narrow that down to a top six or top five. I, I, I'm pretty sure UNC will be in that as, as well as Clemson. I think Notre Dame has big on in, you know, in his circle, Georgia. So, and he didn't use all these official visits. He, he used a lot of unofficials as well. Uh, I believe Clemson and probably Notre Dame are the favorites to possibly get some fall visits in. And I think he's one that's going to uh, take it down to the close to the, the ending point there on uh, maybe national signing day in December. Now, didn't you, but you also said, and I want you to explain to people this as well, that he would be a luxury for Carolina. They don't have to bring in another wide receiver yet. They'll hold out. And if on signing day morning, he texts Mac or Longo or, 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 or Coach Galloway or something like that, says, hey, I want to come play for you. Whatever space they need to make for him, they're going to make for him at that time, right? Yeah, and, and I look at it as a couple things. Uh, Carolina's got a lot of young talent at wide receiver. I know they lost Daz, they lost – uh, Diami, but you look at the wide receiver room, and I know Galloway, he loves to have a lot of guys that he can put out there. And this year, I think he's got a lot of guys that he can put out there, um, in, including three that he just brought in the 21 class. You got Paysor, JJ Jones, and um, Devin Blackwell. 
Yeah, Gavin Blackwell. And all three of them are different. That's that's one key yeah. for UNC. They don't try to recruit the the same type. They got Tyshawn Chapman now that is kind of the slot, you know, slot Daz, Ryan Switzer type kid. So if if they sign an elite wide receiver, uh, I think that would be a cherry on top. Um, you know, if they get him, they get him, you know. Um, he's got if you can get if you could get an elite game changing type of kid. Mac has talked a lot about, you know, be the one. Everyone knows the slogan, be the one. What is be the one? Be the one who makes a game changing play. And Andre Green has game changing capability. He's the guy that if you envision down the road, North Carolina actually re, you know, approaching some of its goals, approaching its mission of being a part of the CFB and stuff like that. Well, if you get into a game against Clemson in the ACC championship, where if you win, you get to the CFP. How do you beat Clemson? Well, if you have a guy that can get over the top of that defense, a guy that could beat Clemson corners, you can, and you can have a quarterback and get him the ball. That's how you can win a game. Like that's that's one of the ways you do that. Andre Green's that kind of guy, isn't he? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he he's a he he sort of has moved up the charts on all the recruiting sites because limited limited ex. I mean, not exposure, but limited games. You know, uh, I don't know how many he, pl- he played in Virginia. I, I think Did Virginia he play played a lot less than North but didn't Carolina. He just play five, didn't he just play in five games? Some, some, yeah, I mean, I think Travion Stevenson played in three this, this past spring. So limited, that's why I said it's the, the fall season is going to be key to some kids. I'm now, I'm not going to say just North Carolina, but a lot of class of 22 kids there there's going to be some sleepers pop up in this this fall season that's going to get some some scholarship offers two five-star kids left we'll we'll stay in the state of virginia with zach rice you have been in regular communication with his mom to the point where you know when are you guys going to go out and break bread that's kind of what my joke with you uh his mom has been extraordinarily uh cordial and kind to us by keeping us updated on the stuff. And as much as um, I think as much as Zach has a, a really bright and cheery and inviting personality, he's not doing as much of the communicating with the media at this point in his recruitment. His mom's doing a lot of it for him. I think she's enjoying it. And it's good to have a good spokesperson like that speaking on your behalf. So based on that, what can you gauge about where Zach Rice is from. And let me add this before you answer. When Zach has talked to media who covers recruiting in various schools, he's very positive. He's just a really positive kid. He's got a great spirit about him. And, you know, he could go somewhere and not have the best time, but if he's doing the interview, he's going to focus on the things he did like. He's not going to go into the stuff he didn't. Not a lot of kids do, but you can tell that Zach's been very genuine about a lot of this stuff. So how much, with all those positives and knowing that he's like that, what, do you gauge more from what his mom says or from what he has said about where Carolina stands? I think, I think he's really kind of struggling with the decision just based on uh, his mom has been posting a lot on uh, Twitter, social media. She even told me that, you know, there's a lot of pressure on these kids. I mean, I, I, I can't imagine some of the pressure. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's the top player in Virginia. And there's a lot of pressure, possibly a lot of pressure on people in his area to play for Virginia. I mean, and that's not even talking about his grandfather who played at Virginia. I'm sure that that's weighing heavy. It's important for family. And every time I talk with Ross family, I mean, that's a big word. His grandmother is very important to him, you know, uh, Virginia is in his top list. He's been up there. Charlottesville's not very far from Lynchburg. Yeah, he's been up there several times. Um, And, you know, he wants to make sure he makes the right decision because his mom said it's it's his big – he's – I don't know if he's 18 yet, but it's the biggest decision in the – I want to say my my twangy-twang or the youngin's life. You know, he's got – He's got to go where he 
feels like he's going to be taken care of. And so he's got a lot of great choices. And he's just, you know, there was some possible smoke that he might wanted to, to announce before his season, senior season started. But according to mom, you know, he, he's kind of wanting to see how things go. And, and that's that's certainly his his right to see how things are, are going for a North Carolina, how things are going for Virginia. You know, if it, it, it may determine if North Carolina is four and five and oh, when he possibly goes and watches Carolina play a, a mid fall game, that in the atmosphere in Keenan is just, you never know. Same thing with Virginia. If they're, they're four or five and oh, and they're winning, you know, it might be different if they're two and three. If Carolina's six and oh, when Miami comes to town, a probable night game, oh, and, and Zach Rice is not committed anywhere, I would be willing to bet you he's going to be in the stadium that night. One other thing about him that has intrigued me since you reported this about six weeks ago, I guess it was, maybe, maybe it's a little longer than that, but Carolina has a really interesting um, process where Mac has a couple of older ex-coaches, guys that have been in football for so, so long, Kenny Browning, uh, Daryl Moody, and John a blank, uh, Sparky Woods. These guys have all, you know, Sparky Woods, head coach of South Carolina a long time ago. These guys have been around. Um, Daryl uh, Moody's been in the NFL as a scout, Sparky Woods. They, they understand what they're looking at. They can evaluate high school film. They can advise on NFL stuff. They have a system in place there that intrigued uh, Zach's mom because they're they're clearly not just looking at the best place for him to have fun for four years. They're looking at a situation where he can go to school, get a good education, have a system set up where in three, three and a half years, he might be able to get into his degree. They're very close to it, but also have an NFL process where they would get rock solid NFL feedback on a regular basis because Three years after this kid arrives in college, he wants to be in the first round of the NFL draft. He's one of those kinds of ball players that you could easily see being that guy. Whether he goes to North Carolina or Alabama or Notre Dame, he's that kind of guy. So what was it about what I was just talking about that she brought up that a lot of kids' parents and themselves don't bring up very often when we talk to them about recruitment? Well, they, they, they're making total use of the Coleman Indoor Center. They, you, we've been in there. They had this giant big screen on both sides. And they had, you know, Zach could, video games was huge for kids. I mean, how do you, how would you feel if you walked in there and you seen a figure based on your profile up there in, you know, a, a Denver Bronco uniform, a Carolina Panther uniform? You know, here, here's your, you know, projection. You know, this is what we feel you can do to get to that position. So you mentioned it. You, you, you totally hit it with Daryl Moody. I mean, a pro scout for so, so many years. He, he knows, you know, and he's advising these kids. You know, look, look what happened last year. Um, I'm sure he went through the draft process with, Every one of those kids that that left um, told them, you know, what's what, and it and it's it means a lot to have somebody on the, the staff that you can trust that's not going to tell you something, you know, that it, it the truth hurts, you know. If he if he don't think a kid can go, I, I you know he's going to tell them. If he thinks they're going to be, you know, a low draft or you need to come back and work on your route running or you, your pass block, and he's going to tell these kids, and, and they're going to respect him. Uh, so it was it was huge, and I think that made a big impression on Zach and his mom. Travis Shaw is the other five-star kid. Uh, he's – you've known Travis for a long time. You actually went to go – you went to Grimsley's practice the other day. Travis did not participate. We'll get into that in a few minutes, but – He's a guy that we talk about game changing players. You know, Zach Rice in the offensive line can be a part of that, but a game changing guy at the point of attack on the defensive side of the ball 
Carolina has brought in a lot of really high level skill guys, but if you really want to get to the point where you can actually beat Clemson in an ACC championship game or go up against an Ohio state or Alabama or Georgia in a CFP and have a chance to win that game, you've got to have high end dudes on both lines of scrimmage, absolutely on the defensive line. And Travis Shaw is that guy. Travis Shaw looks like he's someone that, unless he gets injured in college, he is also going to be a guy that hears his name high in the NFL draft and will play for a long time and make a lot of money. Before he gets there, Carolina fans would like him to spend three years in Chapel Hill. So there are a lot of reasons you've laid out in podcasting and writing about why you think he can pick North Carolina. So in a, in a succinct sort of manner, Tell everybody listening right now why you think Travis Shaw could pick North, might pick North Carolina. He is very loyal to his hometown. As you know, his final four, Carolina, Clemson, Georgia, and North Carolina a and And that's a sign of respect for A&T, Darren Greensboro, their football program. Uh, they've done a lot for Greensboro. Uh, Travis respects that program. And, you know, he will tell you, you know, they made the top four for a reason. You know, and I, I, and, and I am, you know, he, he is, his name, his brand. What, what if he did commit to A&T? Yeah, that's the other part of this. That, the whole that, of that. that he possibly could get going to a, HBCU school and A&T has a great alumni base and everything. So all you out there sniggering at that, you know, don't because <laughs> that, I mean, excuse me, Travis respects them and, and, you know, he's, he's legitimately considering them. But the NIL money, if he went to North Carolina, we all have seen the last few days that Quinn Ewers, uh, 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 story where he's the high school quarterback in Texas who class of 22, but he's going to go ahead and roll early at Ohio State because he, he can make over a million bucks at NIL money right now, but in Texas, he can't be, he's not eligible if he makes the money. So he's going to roll early at Ohio State and go ahead and get paid. I'm not saying Travis would do this, but, and, and there are only a handful of high school kids who I think can make money. You know, other, anything that would be worth, you know, somebody actually putting their money and their business behind a high school kid. It's a risky thing to do, but they're only a handful of kids. I think Travis is the kind of kid that maybe wouldn't get the money in high school, but he's good in rural early. If he did commit to a North Carolina, sign with a North Carolina, I could see a guy like him being a big part of somebody's business in Greensboro in January. Mm -hmm. And North Carolina would be fine with that because those are the rules now. So you need to have that to help you in the recruiting process, which is something that Mac talked a lot about July 8th, and he also did uh, two weeks ago at the ACC kickoff in Greensboro or in Charlotte. So uh, if you stay home, some kids might be able to make more cash than if they go out, out of state. You think Travis is one of those kids that might find himself in that situation, especially if he produces early in Chapel Hill? Well, getting back to why I think, you know, Carolina is this, has a really good shot is uh, – North Carolina has not been on the national stage. He has the opportunity to be a major factor of getting them to that possible stage. Uh, Clemson is there. Georgia has been there. So North Carolina, is it important for him to help home, his home state to get to that position? He's got a lot of friends there at Carolina. And, you know, that that's something that you, you got to kind of consider. I mean, being him, uh, being loyal, he, he could have went several places in high school. I, I know IMG was mentioned, but he yeah. stayed in Grimsley because he wanted to build something special at Grimsley. And they, they won the state championship yeah. this, this spring. So that's another point, you know, I mean, and, you know, Chapel Hill's an hour from Greensboro, you know, yeah. he's, he, his mom, mom, his family is very important to him. 
so they can they can go right down the road and watch him and, and everything. Um, so uh, he still I, I went down to Grimsley on Monday, first day of uh, high school football practice, hoping to to get Travis because Travis is he's he he likes to uh, uh, be like Bigfoot some with to the media, you know. We uh, you know John brought me. <laughs> he's from that area so, too. Uh, that I mean, we, he's we, hard we, to get. He, he's hard to get. He, yeah. He's hard to get. Yeah, because you, he's you, have, you have you, you have some minor con- communication with him, and when you gave him your Player of the Year award, you had a nice interview with him. But he definitely is not someone who is seeking the microphone. He's not going to yell at every microphone that comes near him. He kind of dodges the limelight. Uh, it's just not. It's just his personality. So, so that's, I why, I, that's one reason why you went to practice was you went so for other I, reasons too. Hold on, hold on. Let's just remind everybody. You also won the NC prep site here in Rivals. So you went to Brimsley because they're defending state champ and all that. And there are a couple of the kids that you want to talk to. But obviously, that's an opportunity to talk to Travis. If you can grab him after practice, then he's going to answer a few questions. So go ahead. Yeah, I was I was helping the network out. I was trying to help our fellow Clemson and Georgia sites too of getting some intel on him and uh, went down to first day of practice. And of course he's, he's still mending from a shoulder injury that he, that happened in the state championship. He's still not released, but you know, when I got there, of course I didn't see a six, six, 325 kid out there. I did see Jamal Jarrett who is six, six, three Oh five, but I didn't see number two. I saw number 55. We'll have a, we have something on him, but um, talk to Coach Brown. He's like, Dina, he's had a family emergency, so uh, he's not here. And, you know, um, wish, hope things, hope everything's okay. But uh, we'll have more opportunities to get Mr. Shaw because I don't think, I don't really think he's in a hurry to do anything. I mean, I could see him waiting till, Whatever the signing day is in December, I mean, I might be, I might be at Grimsley High School on that day, sitting there, uh, front row, waiting for Travis to decide where he's going to go. We're going to have to send you to Grimsley and Andre Green's High School and the Zach Price's High School all on the same day, right? <laughs> Can you manage that? And by the way, for for some of you, there are a lot of people out there that are uncomfortable with the NIL stuff. Whether you like it or not, NIL is a reality, and it's, and it's a part of recruiting pitches. I asked Mac a few weeks ago about the questions and how much he has to talk NIL with, with recruits' parents and stuff now, and it is a regular part of their discourse. So it is very much a thing. And I'm sure yeah. Travis can make money regardless, but if he does stay in state and does some amazing stuff, it's just going to bolster his value. Well, now since the NIL stuff has come out, that has entered the picture when I talked to these kids. Yeah. You know, I asked Amari and Hampton when I was at Cleveland High School the day he announced, did the NIL brand for, for UNC, did that help? And of course he said yes, because yep. there's, there's that, that Carolina blue is very unique, very distinct. Dis- it's very distinct. <laughs> distinct, I'm excuse when, me. When people turn on the TV in Carolina, usually when they're playing, now sometimes they don't look like North Carolina, but usually they don't need to look at the little score in the corner to see who's playing. <laughs> they know one of the schools, in basketball or football. Okay, so I'm not going to entirely put you on the spot here, but with the six that we're talking about, you know, a couple could commit – before September, it's possible a couple could before then. But you think we're talking October, November, maybe December for some of these kids, or or, or would 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 nothing surprise you because of the nature of the way things are now? With this this year, there's nothing that would surprise me. Yeah. You know, uh, but if you put me on the spot. I would say that. There might be, like I just said, there might be three that are really late, and those three are the the, the more highly ranked. I think Petway, Pope, and Gosnell will 
commit earlier than the other three just because of uh, maybe spaces and stuff. So Okay, so those three, if Carolina gets one, is it Pat White? Of the, the three. Of the first three, of the first, first three you were three, talking about. I think the odds with Pat Way are very good. So Pat, Pat Way in the first three, and of the back three, Green, Rice, and Shaw, if you had to choose one, and if, they, if they're going to get one, uh, I look, look, just for, for, you, for you love to put on. me on the spot. Let me be okay, honest with everybody. Had, hold on, let me, let me be honest with everybody for a moment before you answer. I've been teasing her for a while that I was going to put her on the spot more in some of our podcasts, but we haven't done one for a while like this. So I decided, you know what? Let's have a little fun with it. So you got to pick one out of the three. And if you don't think any of the three, you're more than welcome to say, I don't think any of them are going to Carolina. I think they're going to get one in that group, and I think you're going to get one of the first. I think you might get three of these six, but but you're the expert here. Go ahead. I think they're going to get three, possibly out of that, and anything after that could be really cherries on top. I think they're all cherries. And, and don't if you? I had a if I had a gun pointed at me, I would say Travis Shaw. Okay. Now, for those reasons I stated above. Are four of these six cherries, hold on, are four of these six cherries on top? Um, Gosnell would be a great pickup. Pope, be, the staff loves Pope. Pope might be underrated based on the different recruiting services that are out there. The staff views him much higher than any of the recruiting services do. But the way we look at it, Petaway, Rice, Shaw, and Green, they're all cherries, aren't they? <laughs> So it's not just one cherry. You're gonna have a lot of cherries squishing all the whipped cream. Uh, you be George Washington chop, chop a cherry tree now, but I think I drove by his house yesterday. By the yeah, way, yeah, I, I, I was back I, up in Virginia. I, if you're gonna put me on the spot, I'll say Travis. No, in, no in, uh, disclaimer. No inside information at all. It's just what my gut tells me. I. I I try to, um, with what the kids tell me, their reactions, what they do, that's just what, what I feel. I feel that Travis Shaw, um, he, he's a loyal kid. He, he, could, he, could, he could go anywhere he wanted to and play high school football. He could go to, he could have went to IMG, but he stayed at Grimsley. Well, be, because because I put so much a, a, a good football team. Well, because I put so much one there. Yeah, so. well, and you're right. They've got other talent, and you've, Jamal Jarrett's another one of your guys over there. Uh, be, because I put so much stock into what you say. If, if I have to choose three, and nobody's asking, and nobody really cares, we'll say it anyway. Petaway, Shaw, and Gosson. I know that I know that you might say, "Come on, AJ, about Gosson," but because he, he again, he might be in the sort of a new fact-finding phase right now. But I just think that the, I just kind of vibe, just my personal vibe. Well, I, I know that the, t the staff have has put in t numerous hours on these kids. Yeah. And, um, you know, wherever they go, it is, they've been battling. But it, and, and if they, they lose the battle, it's just like, got to, you know, get better you know you, you sometimes sometimes you might lose the recruiting battles but you gotta you gotta beat teams on the those teams on the field so uh we, we just have to wait and see I, I, i'm i'm just kind of warning the 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 fans that you know it, it's gonna possibly be a while and you're just gonna have to be along with the ride. Now there might be some 23s that start popping, you know? Yeah. Well, that before. will. I mean, and they've got the first, and we'll do a 23 podcast later, but I think that getting a quarterback and a quarterback that will be a four star when they start coming out the 23, the full 23 rankings, that is huge. It also helps if you're talking about kids that are going to wait, let's say for the sake of discussion, all six of these kids are uncommitted when we go into October. The first six games on Carolina's schedule, the Tar Heels should win. I know opening at Blacksburg is tough. UVA could give them some trouble. 
They should win those six games. FSU will be improved, but they're coming to Chapel Hill. They should be 6-0 and when Miami comes to town, and they're going to want all those kids there. And if they win that one, then they have a week off. The last weekend in, November, in October, they go to South Bend on NBC on Saturday night. The kids won't be there, but they're all going to be watching on TV. The schedule sets itself up for kids that are going to want to look and see what year three under this regime looks like. There is a really good chance that as we get to Halloween, things could look really, really good for this program, and they might get a few pops. They might sway a few kids in addition to everything else based on their performance on the field as well. They will see living proof that everything truly is going in the right direction on a, in a big-time way. What a big recruiting tool that would be to be able, if they're at that point, bring those kids down in that environment. And, uh, you know, it could be magical, kind of like the the year that Matt's first year when they they beat Miami there under the lights. I mean, you, Daz Newsom's big touchdown catch. Yep. Think, think um, about it. Think about it if you're in the minds of these six kids. And we're going to end this podcast here in a minute. It's the longest podcast you and I have ever done, by the way. So. <laughs> Sounds like one of our this. conversations that we have. Oh, well, I go, I'll do my six miles and be on the phone with you the whole time. But anyway, think about this. October, the week of October 30th, Carolina 7 and 0. They're ranked in the top five. And Sam is very much, they're ranked in the top five. They're in the CFB conversation. Everybody's saying, boy, if they could go to South Bend and win that game, they're in great shape. Sam is in the Heisman talk. They will sound like what you hear every year about Alabama and Ohio State and Clemson. But they'll be sort of the new fresh guy on the block and a little bit different that North Carolina is there. And they have that distinctive look, that distinctive color, and that extremely likable head coach who, who every time he talks to the media, every time he's on a national show, he helps his program. He's amazing at what he does. I think it, I think it'd be for us covering this, covering the team and covering that, if that happens – It'd be a really fun thing to cover. I'm not rooting for him to do anything like that. As an objective journalist, it, personally, it doesn't matter. However, professionally speaking, it would be kind of neat to cover something with that much hysteria going on with all kinds of prongs, CFP, unbeaten, going to South Bend, recruiting about to go completely off the charts. That would be a neat thing for a lot of long-suffering Carolina football fans. But we're getting way ahead of ourselves, aren't we? A little bit. Yeah, but it's fun. That's what college football is all about. about. Look, every, every time I went back home for a couple of days up in Northern Virginia to do some do some research for something. I listened to a lot of ESPNU radio, and the only thing they're talking about is Oklahoma, Texas, how to say, well, can the Big 12 survive? And then a few comments about Florida State and Clubs are going to leave the ACC. Of course, they, have, they don't understand what grant rights mean, so. So it's nice to actually have a conversation about something very, very different and hear someone say something very, very different because that's all anyone's talking about right now. So who knows? They go up to Blacksburg and stumble. None of this matters. And they have to work really hard to win those kids, right? Yeah. Uh, all it's, right. Uh, I'm about talked out, Andrew. We've, this is our I know. I've podcast worn you out. we've never done. Well, you volunteered to do some research early in this podcast. So I'm holding you to it. So let's get on it. The workday never ends for us, Dana. All right. Well, that's good stuff. I I, I, I always enjoy uh, doing this when we're just on the phone. Now we just did it on a video, so I hope other people enjoy it as well. She is Dana King. I'm Andrew Jones. You have been watching TarHillIllustrate.com right here on our YouTube channel, Tar Heel Illustrated. By the way, if you haven't been to our site, go to it, TarHillIllustrate.com. Lots of good stuff there for you. Thanks for stopping by.